All right. Well, uh, up next, we've got uh, Greg, who's going to be talking about how to design some magical experiences for developers, which is awesome. Hey, Greg, how you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Doing awesome. Well, I will uh, give you the stage. Awesome. Thank you, Tony. Uh, take it away. Right. Sounds good. All right. Hello, API Days New York. Uh, I'm coming to you from San Francisco, unfortunately. Uh, hopefully next year we can do this in person. Um, this is still a bit better than my API Days Australia situation, though. Uh, not only am I out of trip to Australia, I now have to give a talk at 4 a.m. So my name is Gregory Koberger. Oh, let's flip the camera. Maybe. There we go. So my name is Gary Koberger, and I'll be your guide for the next 20 minutes or so, plus maybe a few minutes of uh, Q&A if we have time. Uh, I am the founder of README. We build uh, the UIs for APIs. From docs to community to dashboards to tools for understanding how people are using your API, README handles everything that is in the API itself. Today, oops. Today, I'm going to talk about building magical developer experiences. We all know that feeling. You're using a new dev tool, and something works so incredibly well that you're like, whoa, magic. Now, this talk's going to be a little interactive, so you'll need a few things. Uh, you'll need to go to this website uh, if you want to play along. Uh, that's apidays.readme.com. You can do that right now if you're ready. Uh, second, you'll need to make an API call, so whatever CLI or programmer you use should be ready to go. All right, let's talk about APIs. They're supposed to be really easy, right? You make a request to a URL, and you get a structured response back. But in reality, APIs are never actually this simple. Somewhere along the line, we've made the simple concept so damn complicated. Like, let's look at sending data, for example. There's so many different ways to do it. There's uh, query params, body params, form data, cookies, headers, path params, et cetera. And they're all serialized completely different ways. That's crazy, but we just accept it. People just want to charge a credit card or send a text, but we make it so difficult. I don't know why. The only goal of your API is to be used. But somehow, we put up a ton of roadblocks, and we've made it a torturous experience. So let's do a quick, uh, let's do a quick exercise. Everyone close your eyes and think of the best API on the internet. Just imagine it. Now open your eyes. I'm going to try to guess what you picked. Was it Stripe or maybe Twilio? Now, I'm sure I didn't get it right for absolutely everyone. But for most of you, you thought Stripe or Twilio. And that's kind of crazy, isn't it? There's literally hundreds of thousands of APIs out there, yet everyone says the same thing. It seems that despite the near infinite number of APIs, there somehow aren't many very good ones. Now, this conference is for legacy industries, and that implies legacy APIs. One of the biggest problems with improving your API is that they're almost impossible to change once they're in production. You don't want to break anything for anyone, so you're kind of stuck. But that's a horrible excuse. There's a ton you can do. In fact, I'm going to add an extra constraint to this talk. We're going to talk about transforming legacy APIs into magical experiences without actually touching the API itself. And it's not even that hard. Remember when you pictured your favorite API? You probably weren't thinking about JSON or XML, right? You were probably imagining their documentation. Remember when I said we're going to write some code? All right, we're going to do that now. Everyone go to uh, apidays.readme.com and get ready. We're going to have a quick competition to see who can make an API call the quickest. The first person to get the name of the leaderboard will win. So in just a moment, the website will reload, and you'll have access to all the docs. You'll have about two minutes. And while this is happening, I'll play a song that I wrote about APIs for people who don't want to play along. All right. Ready, set, go. Last night when I sent you a request, you returned the status quo. One I didn't expect. Everything used to be 200, okay. But now you've 410 gone away. When we first met, you were pretty skeptic. But my 429, too many requests, were 202 accepted. We started out as friends and then we became lovers 
But now you want to 303. When someone successfully makes an API call, it'll, uh, it'll show up here. We won't be coming around. Now 403, forbidden love is now 404, not found. Sure, we'd been having a few 409 conflicts, but it wasn't anything. Okay, we got a few errors popping up. Time out. Couldn't fix. Situations change, but I feel the same inside. My love for you is 304, not modified. I hope this all was just a 302, temporary. But now, you 301 moved on to permanent. Almost out of time. I can't believe you won't be coming around. Now 403, forbidden love is now 404, not found. Sure, we've been having a few 409 conflicts, but it wasn't anything 408 timeout couldn't fix. Everything used to be 200 okay, but now you 410. All right, we've got a bunch of people with errors trying to get the events one. All right. So no one, oh, it looks like, nope, no one was able to, uh, to actually make a, a successful request. Oh, nope, Trojan was. Uh, someone named Trojan was from, uh, from Curity. Um, okay, so one person was able to make it happen. That was not a pleasant experience. You're stuck running around, finding a bunch of clues in different places and trying to bring them all together. You have to set up a full dev environment or at least a terminal or postman. You probably even had to Google the uh, curl commands or something like that. It was a bit like an escape room, but a lot less fun. There's no reason it has to be this hard though. The docs were terrible, but they weren't that far off from most docs out there. I just use common tropes I see all the time in API documentation. So now we're gonna do it one more time. This one will be a lot quicker, I promise. I'm gonna make some changes to the documentation and walk through it. There haven't been any improvements to the API itself. It's still pretty crappy. We're just gonna change the documentation. Uh, you can play along on, your, uh, on the website. Uh, first, I'm gonna put all the info we want on the, on one, uh, sorry, I'm gonna put all the info on one page. When we write documentation, we structure it in a certain way, like a book where we try to use content as little as possible. But that's not how people tend to read documentation online. They tend to go to a certain page and start there, either because it seemed like the page they wanted or they got there directly via Google. No one wants to jump around between different pages looking for clues. It costs absolutely nothing to include the same information on every single page. So every documentation page should be self-contained. Next, I have a foolproof trick that doesn't matter how horribly bad your API is. There's one surefire way to make sure it's dead simple to use, no matter how convoluted or complicated it is. Code samples. Rather than forcing people to cobble together requests of their own, we cut out so much work by just giving them a damn code snippet that runs. So I've added one to our docs now. I only did Node, but you should have as many languages as possible. Having a code sample removes so much ambiguity. How should things be encoded? What should be included and where? One line of code can remove a paragraph or so of explanation text. Note that it has our API key right in it. When we play this game again, you'll be able to try the API right in line, right on the page. Next, I've updated the parameters to let you edit them right on the site. Let people tweak code snips in real time. It reduces so much complexity. And lastly, if you scroll down, I've added logs, so you can actually debug what's going on in real time. APIs are a black box. You send off data and hope something positive will come back. Showing API logs to a user removes so much of that uncertainty. Everyone can see exactly what's happening at all times. All right, we're gonna try this again, and we'll see how quickly we can get this. Ready, three, two, one, go. I won't even play a song this time. There's a gigantic try it now button. All right, we're already getting people. Uh, it's just your name at uh, u.com, but see how easy that was? We got 30, uh, oh, first person to put a name in was uh, API Handyman. We got a Kiara in here. All right, that was pretty fast. It took like 12 seconds compared to the three minutes that we did before and only one person actually got it before. Now it might seem like we're comparing apples to oranges there. The second version seemed almost like cheating a bit, it was so easy. 
but both are just stocks for the exact same API. Our goal is to get people to the MVC as quickly as possible. By MVC, I mean time to minimum viable, viable call. It's just the most minimum call you can possibly make that does something, whether it be if it's Twitter making a tweet or if it's uh, you know, Stripe charging your credit card. Trying to get them from zero to 60 as quickly as possible is incredibly important. But there's so many more ways than just documentation. One of my favorites is command line tools that wrap APIs. They can be very action oriented and combine multiple APIs. They take care of gluing together everything really nicely and printing out the results well. It makes me wonder why we can't make APIs that are as easy to use as CLI tools. We'll talk about this in a minute. Errors are another great place to make magic. Imagine if error codes didn't just tell you what was wrong, but actually told you how to fix the problem. Or better yet, what if it's secretly just behind the scenes corrected API calls and fixed the problems without you ever knowing? Forget a content type? No problem. Encode your API key in the wrong way? No worries, we got you. Anything you can do to make error codes go from bad to good will feel like magic. Another option is tools like Zapier. They enable so many people to make API calls. Why are we so gatekeepery about who gets to use our APIs? Why do we think that only people who know how to program should be able to do something cool with our product? All right, so back to the original point of this talk. We're gonna talk about magic. In my mind, calling an API or developer tool magic is the highest compliment that you can give it. It means the creator has worn down the rough edges so much that you're left with a completely frictionless experience. So what does magic mean? As developers, we're constantly squaring off against hard problems. So when something comes along and makes one of those hard problems feel effortless, it gives us that same exact feeling as watching a card appear out of thin air. We know it's not supposed to work that way, but it just did. We saw it with our own eyes, magic. When you think of magic, there's two categories that come to mind. The first is ancient wizardry, an unpredictable, contradicting mashup of elixirs and spells. The other is modern stage magicians, real human beings who seemingly defy the laws of physics right in front of us. In terms of Harry's, it's Potter versus Houdini. The magic we're going for is the latter. It exists in our world, it exists in our world, and is bound to the same physics everyone else is. Think about a magic trick. The best ones are deceivingly simple. And at the end, you know exactly what happened. Most magicians even tell you what's going to happen at the end. Sure, you don't know how it happened, but who cares? You followed the premise from start to finish, and they guessed your card or levitate or something like that. But magic tricks aren't simple. They just look it. It could take years to master something that only takes a few seconds to perform. Each trick is a combination of technology and technique, hidden out of view of the spectator. Nobody has defined the laws of the universe. They're just obscuring them. If you were to read a book on how to do a certain magic trick in a book, it would be a pretty mundane step-by-step. -step. Sure, some things might take years of practice, but at no point would you not be able to follow the logic. The magic feeling comes from obscuring, obscuring a few steps. The magic trick that might have 15 steps in the that the magician performs, but you only see two of them. So let's apply this to DevTools. Take something like uh, Vercel. It used to be called Zite, if you guys know that. You just type in the word now in the command line, and it makes the current directory a fully hosted live website out on the internet and gives you a URL. When you first use it, it feels like magic. Rather than spending any time configuring things, you just type three characters, N-O-W, and that's it. The same 20 steps that were done behind the scenes as if you were using AWS are still done. Just Vercel obscures them for you. So how did they get there? I imagine they started at the end and worked their way backwards. I've of course never designed a magic trick. However, imagine it goes something like this. You start with something audacious at the end, something that defies all sense and logic. You're going to levitate, you're going to read someone's mind, you're going to teleport, it doesn't really matter. And then you work backwards and figure out how to make it seem like you just did that. We can't possibly go the opposite way. We can't start at the beginning and somehow end up somewhere magical because we just get bogged down by the rules, whether they're the rules of physics or logics or even rest in this case. For Vercel, I imagine they start at the end. What's the fewest characters we can have a user type and have a fully live site? I bet we can do three. And when you start from the beginning, you start thinking about configurations and storage and blah, 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 blah. But when you start at the end though, you reframe everything. You're no longer thinking, here's how the user configures the language, here's the parameters they pass in, things like that. Rather, you're talking about how can we figure out the language they're asking? How can we guess the parameters that they want? And that goes for APIs too. When you decide to build an API and start from the beginning, you start piling on all the RESTful greatest hits, query params and headers and content types and all that fun stuff. But if you start from the opposite side, you'd have a much easier time at simplifying things. It's easier said than done though. No amazing developer experience has ever happened by accident. 
If there's one you love, it's because someone gave a damn about every single detail, from error messages to documentation to naming syntax to design to pricing. My favorite definition of magic comes from Penn and Teller, and it sums up this entire talk. Sometimes, magic is just spending more time on something than anyone might reasonably expect. All right, that is my talk. Um, if you enjoyed it, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, I am at G Koberger. If you really enjoyed it, uh, you can try readme.com. Uh, we do pretty much everything that we talked about here. And if you really, really enjoyed it, come work with me. Uh, we're hiring at readme. You go to readme.com slash careers. Um, I think now we have maybe a few minutes for questions. I'm not completely sure. Tony? We do. We do. We have some time for questions. So Awesome. I got it in quick. Yes. That's awesome, man. Uh, great, great talk. And let's uh, see if there are any questions. So also, just so everybody knows, the... Uh, the video for us, it's about a 15 to 20 second delay. So uh, that's why I'm just kind of, if if you type in a question, and you wonder why I'm just sitting here chatting and ignoring you. It's because I'm not seeing it quite yet. I can play more music. I have a song called uh, Moves Like Swagger that I wrote. Oh, that that is amazing. You know, in fact, some of the comments are people were asking for uh, for your songs. I'll send out the uh, the entire mixtape after. That's great. Yeah, if you stop playing once we get some questions. If you have a Bandcamp link, I'd say drop that. Drop that in. There it is. API mixtape. That's amazing. So, Greg, I don't know if you see this, but that guitar behind me. Yes. Covered in a and startup API stickers. Okay. I have seen it in person in uh, Austin a few years ago. Oh, right on, right on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, sweet. Awesome. It looks like that we don't have any questions. And so Seems like it's lunchtime then. It is lunchtime. And the great thing about virtual conferences is that the bars open at lunch if you want <laughs> to be, right? So go network with everybody else. Go check out the expo halls. Talk to the sponsors. You can grab some stickers, maybe. Grab some stickers. No, you can't. You can't grab stickers, but uh, that's okay. Go check everybody out, uh, uh, all the booths out, and we will be back with content in about 20 minutes.